This podcast is brought to you by Most Valuable Podcasts, leading the league in podcasting entertainment. What's up, what's up? Real MVPs, Ricky Whitmer here, along with the Mark Weber. Dub them ease. And one thing, Mark, that I have to say before, obviously, this is the Onside Kick podcast, your one-stop shop for professional football. I can say that now. I'm going to say yep. that every time. AAF, I almost the said AFL. AAF and NFL here on Most Valuable Podcast, the pro football podcast for MVP. The one thing I will say is Dave got thrown off because mm-hmm. I went into the way back machine yeah and was listening to a podcast that you myself and then Mike Rankin did oh, for Patreon long, long like ago. two years ago yeah. um, and he was concerned because I didn't start the podcast off with the Mark Weber mm-hmm. I just said oh I'm joined with Mark Weber and he's like you didn't dub them ease you didn't say the Mark Weber Look what you've done. He was a little confused, but no. The Mark Weber is here, and we got a jam-packed show for you. It's post-combine here for the onside kick. It is almost a and still full free pr- uh, pre- free agency. <laughs> and still pre-free agency. And this is almost a full draft podcast as we're going to look at the combine and kind of look at the risers um, that have helped their stock post-combine. Then we're going to take a look at two in Specific DJ Metcalf is he now the number one overall wide receiver after the combine? And then also Kyler Murray, apparently with his measurements, helped themselves in the Cardinals' eyes, and they're thinking about taking him number one. We're going to ask the question of should the Cardinals draft Kyler Murray with the first overall pick? And then I say almost a full draft podcast because we will have Pat, one of our fellow patrons, on at the end of the podcast to talk a little bit of Bears. Pat wants to ask the question of will the Bears regress in 2019? Before we get started with our Combine Talk, make sure to go and rate and review the Onside Kick on iTunes and Apple Podcasts. It really helps us out. All those good reviews helps boost the podcast and make sure we get into the ears of more and more people and gets more exposure on the Onside Kick and MVP. But Mark... Before we get into the two specifics, the DJ Metcalf and the Kyler Murray, let's talk a little bit about the Combine in general and just some risers, some guys that did well, helped their draft stock this weekend. You'll give a couple, I'll give a couple, kind of an easy segment to start the podcast. I want to start with you. Who is one guy that you thought was a big riser from the combine, combine this past weekend. One uh, that I, I think it definitely is a big riser now is Miles Boykin. It's a wide receiver out of Notre Dame, uh, and people are talking about DK Metcalf mm-hmm. for for good reason for the most part. But the thing that I really like about Boykin is, despite having a slightly lower uh, forty, he did great on his three cone, great on his shuttle, uh, great for the vertical mm-hmm. and the broad jump. So even though he didn't do as good at that 40 time, he made up for it with everything else. Uh, and, and you've got a guy here who can be um, a great all-around wide receiver, mm-hmm. especially for his just pure agility and athleticism uh, with things. You know, I mean, that's what you get out of the three-cone drill, the shuffle, uh, and that'll come back later up on this podcast. Mm-hmm. Um, so remember that. But those are things that he's got, and he's definitely a guy who uh, he's not going to just, bam, there he goes. But he's a guy who can run all his routes. He's a guy who will um, pick up his – Pick up his speed and really get going. He's a guy you can count on. Great wide receiver for the for the Fighting Irish, and you know I I think he's gonna quickly rise up uh, these draft boards after this combine. Well, and the one thing that you also didn't mention that he did very well on. So he's a guy that his measurements. I'm looking at um, NFL.com and they have him at six four. 220 pounds. He's also a guy that I believe had one of the better vertical jumps yep. for wide receivers. He was receivers. the best vertical He jump. had 43.5, which, of course, if you have one of those big receivers, those 6'4", six, 6'5", six, kind of guys, it's good when you can just say, hey, he's a guy we can go out there, 
throw the ball deep, he'll jump up, he'll get it at the highest point exactly. and bring it down. Some of those young quarterbacks could really mm-hmm. use a guy like this. And the one thing that I keep thinking is, I know this is a discussion for another day, but you've got DK Metcalf that did well. Now you got Miles Boykins that are Boykin that did well. How does this affect a guy like Marquise Hollywood Brown, who was absent from the combine, won't be at an yeah. Oklahoma Pro Day because of an injury that he had? The first guy that I want to mention, though, is a so he's a first round guy, and he was pretty much going to be a first round guy. But now the question becomes how high in the first round is he going to be? And that is Montez Sweat. Because Definitely. there's two things that happened even before the combine. There was one thing that happened. Jeffrey Simmons, who was his defensive line mate from Mississippi State, he's injured. He will probably not be a first round pick in the NFL draft. And with Montez Sweat, he had one of the quickest 40s. He had a really impressive 40, really balled out at the combine. He's a guy that in our last mock draft, which our next one is going to be in two weeks' time, he's a guy for you. You had him at 21 in the mock draft. I had him all the way up at 12. He's a guy now that if you look at both of our mock drafts, Mm -hmm. with this combine, with this performance, could maybe crack for me, might be able to crack a top 10 in a mock draft. Yeah, And like I can't speak for you. I'll let you speak for it. But he's a guy that what I would say might be cracking top 15. Am I right? I would think so. I mean, he definitely has kind of risen up the pass rusher, the edge rusher Mm -hmm. uh, charts, especially when you have... Um, when you have some of those other guys who, uh, in, in my eyes, kind of fell off a little bit, easy to move up, easy to move up and get there, uh, especially if the draft you know doesn't go the way of multiple mm-hmm. quarterbacks being taken. Yeah, he can definitely rise up pretty quickly. Yeah, and I, I will say I undersold his 40 time as his 40 time was a combine record mm-hmm. for defensive linemen. And even right here on ESPN it says – um, it puts the 6'5", 260-pounder in the Dwight Freeney, Robert Mathis class of edge rushers with elite initial burst and top-end speed. And that is something that you need off the edge of that speed. So if you have a really good 40 time, he is someone now where it's going to be interesting to see if you're in that top 10, that top 15, hey, you know what? We need a pass rusher. Why not we why not take a look now at Montez Sweat after that combine performance? Who's another guy that you think is gonna be a big riser after the combine? Someone I like to for a lot of people is still being considered first round, but uh, you know, for other people it's kind of a high second round. Mm-hmm. Uh but it's Devin Bush, the linebacker out of Michigan. Hmm. Uh you know, I, I think he's done a lot in the combine to really push himself over the edge just because of his pure athleticism. Uh, I mean, when you're looking at what the combine does, measuring these things, great vertical, great 40, great three cone, uh, great broad jump. He did a really, really good job to kind of cement himself as that guy who, what I always loved in Chicago with a guy like Brian Urlacher, go side to side, mm-hmm. play the whole field, sideline to yeah. sideline. He can move all over. He can do what he needs to do. Uh, you know, five foot 11. It, I think is a concern for a lot mm-hmm. of people when it comes to linebackers. Um, but he did a really good job showing that he can get it done. And maybe somebody says, you know, I know you're 234 pounds, but maybe you lose a little bit of that weight. Maybe we can play you at safety. Mm-hmm. You know, maybe someone wants to move him around a little bit. Uh, five foot 11, you get, like I said, you get a little concerned maybe with, uh, with a linebacker at that size. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I think he did a great job just purely showing that he can be a real playmaker on the defensive side of the ball. Well, I mean, you mentioned that kind of, that even like star position almost from college, Mm -hmm. it's kind of like a Jabril Peppers where it's like, hey, I maybe not the biggest guy to play linebacker, but hey, I can drop back and be in that kind of safety position for a defense. I'm going to go offensive side of the ball, though. One guy that's going to be interesting because – Team need also falls into this as well, but Noah Fant, how is he going to rise on draft boards? Because his his 40 mixed with 
what he did in the bench rep to mix what he did in his, I believe it was his cone drill. He's a guy that, because we came into this talking, you know, Hawkinson versus Noah Fan. Everyone's mm-hmm. like, well, you got the production of Hawkinson, but the kind of athleticism from Noah Fan. And I had him 32 overall to the um, New England Patriots in our last mock. It's going to be interesting to where now after the combine, to me, the question isn't going to be which Iowa tight end goes in the first round. It's going to be where do both of them go in the first round? Because I feel like in most scouts' minds, Hawkinson was going to get a first-round grade. But now post-combine, you look at that raw athleticism, that speed from Noah Fant. If you kind of need a tight end, especially if you're – Later in the draft, I'm even going to say like around 18, 19, 20 at the earliest, you might be stupid to pass on Noah Fant if tight end is something that you really need post-combine. It could. I I still just kind of, this is tradition here, would be surprised to see two tight ends taken Mm -hmm. in in the first round. Mm -hmm. Uh, It doesn't really happen. Or does Fant now become the guy? If there's one, I mean, he was he, he was my one? guy beforehand, so mm-hmm. I, nothing changed for me on that. Yeah, because he had a four point five forty, um, twenty reps on the bench press, and then ripped through the cone drill with a six point eight second on that, plus a thirty nine point five vert. Yeah, um, so I mean, I, I definitely think he he was kind of towards the end of my draft, anyways, mm-hmm. as well. Maybe he does climb himself up, but tight ends are a dangerous position to spend on the first round. Too mm-hmm. high, you got to be careful with that. Um, Who's another one for you? I'm going to go back to the wide receiver position because I, I really – this is a guy who I put in Mark, my first round. Mark loves those wideouts. I, I do. I mean, they're they're great players. that You can really see the athleticism out of them too. And, and that's what that's what you want out of the combine. You want those athletic freaks. Mm-hmm. Uh, a guy who I put into my first round uh, who I had not had previously, Paris Campbell. And now I feel vindicated for putting him there. Uh, <laughs> because really, I, I already talked about Boykin. Mm-hmm. Um Dude, that 40. But, yeah, Paris Campbell, I mean, it's awesome. 4.31 40, uh, best out of the wide receivers, best shuttle time. Mm-hmm. Uh, vertical's not as good because, you know, I mean, it's fifth of the wide receivers, so it's not like it's bad. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then broad jump tied for third uh, with um, 11 feet 3 inches. So it's just... It's just showing that he's got what it takes. Mm-hmm. He really has what it takes, and he's a versatile kind of guy. Uh, and that's what you really saw out of Ohio State is that Campbell can be very versatile, and you can have a lot of teams that get this guy and can play him all over the field. Well, and that's going to be huge for some offenses. And you're dead right, play him all over the field. Because the one thing I had to look up was I'm like, hey, you know what? Like, where does. What's his height? Because the first thing I think of when I think speed mm-hmm. is let's go ahead and put him in the slot. Let's get him on those quick slants. Get him the ball quick as possible so you can use that speed yeah. in the open field. But it's not like he's a 5'11 wide receiver. It's like it's not like he's a Wes Welker, like Julian Edelman type of wide receiver. He's a guy that's 6'1 who you can play in the slot. He's got the speed to do that. But you could also say, okay, Paris, I'm going to put you on the outside, and I'm going to let you go to work. Here's the thing that I wonder, Mm -hmm. and I'm going to throw this at you. I'm going to actually, before I make this comparison, I'm going to go ahead and look at this guy's height as well just to see where we're going. All right, he's taller than this guy, but I'll still ask it anyways. Could Paris Campbell be a better version of Tyreek Hill in the NFL? Where I don't Tyre- know about better. Tyreek like, Hill re- is already really good. Like, And the only reason I say mm. better is Tyreek Hill's got the speed, but he's a 5'10 wide receiver where Paris Campbell has three inches on him. Yeah, I mean, it's possible, but I, I still think just pure productivity, Tyreek Hill's pretty incredible. And or, part of that's the offense that he's in. Or you're sitting there like, hey, Ricky, uh, go ahead and stop making those comparisons because you're having some – Big shoes to fill. The best tweet, though, that mm-hmm. I saw was actually, I showed Dave this. It was Paris Campbell's 40. Then the next picture was the wideouts from the Chiefs. Then the next picture, you swipe over, it's Patrick Mahomes. And then the last picture is just four verts from Madden. Like, just put him on the Chiefs and yeah. then 
make them go four I votes. I'm going to throw one out there, and I don't know if this is me. So I don't know. This is not a riser situation. This is I'm calling this a solidifier. So not the biggest riser from the combine. This is my biggest solidifier mm-hmm. from the combine. Nick Bosa. He's a guy that, you know, just it's hard fa- to rise when you're well, already at number one. And that's why I said solidifier, mm. where we're going to get into the discussion of number one pick later in the podcast. But he is a guy that all you had to say was he's healthy. And I go, all right, he's the number one pick. He is solidified. So long as, as you can get that pick. contract done. Well, exactly. Because anything mean, like his brother, he's not playing without that well, contract it, language being it, figured out. You know them Bosa's. You know the Mannings help. The Mannings force you to trade from one team to another because yep. they don't want to play for the Chargers. They want to play for the Giants. Them Bosa's. You know they they want to get that language right in their contract. They want it absolutely yeah, correct. But I mean, Nick Bosa a little bit smaller. Then his brother, Joey Bosa, with the measurements that he had at the Combine. But it's one of those things where he showed off his quickness. Not the best 40 time, but still had a quick 40 time at 4.7. or Yeah, 4.79. I think that'd be even quicker than I'd run the 40. Um, and the biggest thing is he's healthy. And now it's just a question of, will the Cardinals, and I'm going to spoil it, will the Cardinals be stupid enough to pass on him? at the number one pick, now that he's had this combine performance, who's one more guy you'd want to throw out there if you have one? I'm going to throw, instead of a riser, uh, I'm going to go the opposite direction because we've talked about this guy on the podcast a few times. Mm -hmm. Daniel Jones, I think, solidified the fact that he's not a first-round pick. Okay. He he is not there. I mean, he he, arguably he might not even be worth a second-round pick. Mm -hmm. Uh, Daniel Jones went out, looked like he was a little too much to that throw, Accuracy, not incredible. Um, you know, just doesn't look like a guy who's really got it. The arm strength, we already were concerned about that. Mm-hmm. To me, he just went in the combine. He looked like a below average quarterback. He looked mm-hmm. like a guy who you say seventh round. You know, I'll, I'll take that flyer on it because he, the guy. I mean, I, I got. I hate to put it out there, but if you need a guy mm-hmm. to throw for fifteen yards. I don't know that I'm really going to count on Daniel Jones. Mm -hmm. Uh, And and that really comes down to me. He does not have the arm strength he needs. He, there's too much to fix in his throwing motion. uh, And his accuracy is just not that great. It's just, it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen for Daniel Jones. And if any team really were truly to try and take him in the second, third round, I think they're severely going to regret it unless they have years to work on the guy. Here's I'm going to take that, and I will actually do the same thing to end mm-hmm. this. I will take you and raise one. The Most of the running backs we saw. They were not the, very like, good. Except for maybe Justice Hill. Mm-hmm. Like One of the guys I'll throw out there is David Montgomery, where he's a guy that Brandon has been all over yeah. this draft process. There's a few of these guys that have some hype to them, and they just disappointed. Well, and the thing that I was looking at is – so I know that, like, the 40 time isn't everything. Like, you can have a bad 40 time and still kind of be a good prospect. But it's, like, guys that I was looking for, like Nick Brosette, 4.72. I'm like, ugh. Miles Gaskin, yeah, he had a uh, 4.5. That's pretty good for Haskins. Like, Damian Harris didn't really blow me out of the water. Of course, you had, to me, the biggest one was Justice Hill with that 4.4. 4. 40, but it's like even like Elijah Holyfield, where it's like, okay, Mm -hmm. what can you do running back out of um, Georgia 4.740? And then Montgomery, that 4.6, I'm like, like, ugh, what's going on with these running backs? Even like Benny Snell, I expected him to be quicker than his 4.640. Just not a good year for running backs. Yeah, and I'm just looking, and I wonder if because of that, we're going to see guys like. Justice Hill get drafted later and kind of, or might get drafted a little bit earlier than we thought. Even a guy like Travion Williams, who 4.51, he's a quick guy Mm -hmm. out of Texas A&M. More importantly, how is this going to help guys like Bryce Love and Josh Jacobs, who didn't run? They were injured. Like They're recovering from injuries and didn't run. This is kind of the opposite conversation of what we're going to have next with DJ Metcalf, where yeah, I didn't run, but it helped me because the rest of the running backs did.
didn't blow me out of the water. Yeah, I mean, it was dangerous for Jacobs, who probably, for a lot of people, were going to say he's the number one running back. Mm -hmm. Um, It was dangerous for him because he's sitting there going, I hope nobody uh, looks impressive because they look impressive. They might jump me. Mm -hmm. Uh, No one's going to jump him. Right now, I none of the running backs were really that impressive. Well, this is where you guys come in. Let us know what you guys think down below in the comment section. Who were your big? I'll just say it. Who were your biggest risers? Who were your biggest fallers? Who did you like from the combine? Who did you didn't like? Let us know what you guys are thinking down below in that comment section. But Mark, now we're gonna take a deep dive into two specific kind of draft topics from the combine. The first thing before we get into everything, make sure to follow us on Twitter. I'm at Ricky Widmer. Mark is at the Mark Weber. Um, the with two E's, not one. The Royal, right? The Royal V. Is that what that's called? It is. When you use two, so the Royal <coughs> V. Mark Weber. Um, and then obviously, most valuable pod is most valuable podcast. Make sure to follow us on Twitter. Interact with us. I love interacting with you guys with your questions and your thoughts as you guys watch the podcast and about the sports that we watch each and every day. But Mark, one guy we've got to talk about. After this combine is DK Metcalf. I will say in the last segment, I accidentally, I will forever call him DJ Metcalf. Only because yeah. we were talking about DJ Moore in the last mock draft. It's going to be your special uh, job to whenever DK. I say DJ, just cut me off. DK. Just, don't worry about being rude. Just say exactly that, DK, so that I say it right and give him the respect that he deserves. Putting that respect on his name. But DK Metcalf balling out at the combine, especially with that 40 time of a 4.3. It blew up Twitter, set the world on fire. Not only that, mm-hmm. 27 reps in the bench press, then a 40.5 vertical jump for a wide receiver. This guy was balling. I am going to ask you, based off of Marquise Brown, who Brandon and I talked in a PTP segment about Mm -hmm. how the Combine, will his absence hurt him? I'm going to ask you this. Now after the Combine, is DK Metcalf the number one wide receiver? He is not. He's not the number one wide receiver. Uh, I do think he helped his stock, and Mm -hmm. I do think he climbs up. uh, And I do think that the right team could do something very well with him. Uh, but I'm going to make a comparison here to somebody you know very uh, very well. Uh, Cordero Patterson is who he reminds me of. A guy who has the ability to run in a straight line very well, doesn't have the ability to really run routes. And the reason I say that is because DK Metcalf, despite having some very impressive showy numbers here, he also has one that everybody conveniently ignores, and that's a 7.38-second cone, cone. Did he fall? Like, you look at that and you say, how? How is it that his 40 time, and this is going over to his shuffle, mm-hmm. or his shuttle now, his 40 time was less than his shuttle. Mm-hmm. Once again, I ask, Did you fall? Like, that's not supposed to happen in case anybody knows. You know, especially for a wide receiver, you are supposed to be better at the shuttle than you are at the at the 40. Yeah. Uh, What that shows you is you can't run routes. And that's what's concerning in that case. And a fun fact here that I have to throw out there, uh, a I'll say a certain goat that has a better three cone time than Mm -hmm. DK Metcalf, Tom Brady. Wow. And does anybody think that Tom Brady is agile? Well, no, you know what that is? That's attention to detail. That is that's all Tom's attention to detail right, right there. Cuz like even and I'm going to throw this out to help your point mm-hmm. is that I'm looking at the so the draftnetwork.com, they're kind of one of their player profiles on DK Metcalf and under route running, just the first part of it says, let's talk about what his fault is. Metcalf needs to show better attention to detail in his patterns at times, breaking his routes off more exactly, showing a better awareness of the sideline and being more efficient with his footwork. That shows with the with yeah. the shuttle and the cone drill. Exactly. And, and you know what I would love to see, though, for, for DK Metcalf? Like I said, mm-hmm. he's improved his draft stock because he showed – Something that he can do very, very well. Yeah, He can work very well for a team that's got a strong-armed quarterback. Mm-hmm. Who The team already has a slot 
wide receiver. They've already got some options. They need somebody to be on the end, and they need them to just go down the field. That can work very well. And if DK Metcalf were to be the number one wide receiver, I go back to my mock draft that we had in our 4.0 when I Mm -hmm. had the Buffalo Bills draft Marquise Hollywood Brown at number nine overall. Now, if the Buffalo Bills were drafting a wide receiver, I might say, Maybe they do DK take a Metcalf. DK Metcalf. Because you got you got Josh Allen, mm-hmm. the guy who can sling it 70, 80 yards. Uh, you know, that might work out really well because he's really fast and he doesn't really have to do routes. He can just vertical. Mm-hmm. Um, that might work out pretty well. Another team like the Denver Broncos. I sit there and I think that would work. They're the very next pick at number 10. You know, even though I don't necessarily know that they completely need it, but they do. I guess actually, yeah, they do probably need some wide receivers there. Yeah. Um. So that might be another good option there of a guy who Joe Flacco who can mm-hmm. sling it. He's got a better arm than most. Give him a guy who can just run down the field. See, and I don't disagree with you because I'm the thing I don't disagree with you on is DK Metcalf just because he had a four point three forty. He's not a perfect prospect. Yeah. It's not like he's a perfect wide receiver prospect. But the thing that I wonder is that this 40 and this performance overall at the Combine, especially like some of the big things, and I feel like this is the thing that kind of took us and why we were Mm -hmm. overshadowing the shuttle and the cone drill, is how many times did you go on Twitter or online and the first thing you were seeing when you searched Combine was DK Metcalf without a shirt on. Because yeah. it blew up to it. Like, as oh, soon as sure. that picture of him without a shirt on with that washboard ab look mm-hmm. hit Twitter, it was like we forgot. Because I feel like the biggest question for him coming in, and this was one thing that Brandon had mentioned, was, oh, you know, well, he's got that neck injury. How is he going to do after that neck injury? And then we see that body, and then we see the bench press. And I think because yeah, we ripped. were, I feel because we were so worried about, oh, what's his physicals going to look like because of that neck injury that he was coming off of, mm-hmm. we just completely ignored everything else. Like, he's still a guy that needs to work on his route running. He still needs to be a guy that, yeah, it's great you can run fast. It's like I almost threw out when you mentioned Paris Campbell in the first segment of like, yeah, it's great he could run uh, that quick, but uh, can he catch the ball? <laughs> if he can catch the ball, then he can mm-hmm. be a great wide receiver. And the thing with DK that I think will be interesting that might make him the number one wide receiver is Marquise Hollywood Brown's foot injury is because the thing that we're looking at is, and we talked about this with Josh Jacobs in the first segment, of Jacobs is lucky. The running backs did not outperform him. Yeah. Well, Marquise Brown now has to sweat a little bit. Quite a few wide receivers did really well. Quite a few wide receivers did well, and probably the one that we were kind of pitting one and two balled out and was one of the, and when I say, I should say ran out um, and bench pressed out at the combine, and he basically stole the show for most people that, it is now in most people's minds they're going to push Hollywood Brown a little bit to the side, even though he's a better route runner Mm -hmm. than DK Metcalf is, but we didn't see it at the Combine. We're not going to see it at an Oklahoma Pro Day. And I feel like, especially like DK Metcalf, if he now, let's say at a Old Miss Pro Day, has a Johnny Manziel, I think it was the Johnny Manziel type performance where the music's blaring and yeah. Johnny's just rifling these passes. If he can go out and do these like do these routes and really kind of because a pro day, the thing is, it's all scripted. Exactly, um, you've been practicing it for months. If he can look really good on the pro day, maybe that helps people forget more about the shuttle and the cone drill mm-hmm. and. A good pro day now can solidify DK Metcalf Potentially. not only as a top 15 pick, but the number one wide receiver in the draft. Yeah, well, for, first wide receiver 
taken in the draft. I'll yeah, say. for for DK, I think it's just he's got to go to the right spot. Mm-hmm. It's got to be the right team. It's got to be the Buffalo Bills. It's got to be the Denver Broncos. It's got to be uh, the Green Bay Packers. Somebody who's got a quarterback uh, that can just sling it and needs a deep threat with the rest of the offense being pretty mm-hmm. pretty all right already. I mean, you know, you can't go somewhere where it's like. All it's going to be is DK Metcalf because all you got to do is put a safety on top, and all of a sudden you're good to go. Mm-hmm. You don't have to worry about it. Um, that's that's really the case he needs. So it depends. He could be the first wide receiver taken off the board if it's the right team. But I still think that, I mean, it would be one thing if the three cone and the shuttle were just bad mm-hmm. uh, or just not, you know, just below average, but they're pretty bad. They're pretty yeah. bad. And, I mean, the thing I'm looking at is, so you say it depends on, like, what teams need a wide receiver. Mm-hmm. So according to NFL.com, I'm Well, gonna, it depends on which teams are taking them, and yeah. that, too. Yeah. I am just going to – we'll go through really quickly teams that need a wide receiver. And of course, not all these teams are going to be taking them. The first one that needs a wide receiver, he ain't going to go to. You want to know why? Why is that? It's the Arizona Cardinals. They're not yep. drafting him number one. The next team that needs a wide receiver – is and this is like top three need. This isn't like their number one need. The 49ers, he ain't going number two. The next one I could see, but I'm gonna say no also. The New York Jets at three. I don't think they take a wide receiver. They're actually looking to trade the pick um and trade back. Hopefully someone like wants a Dwayne Haskins and can move up to three. Um so there he's not gonna go three. The th- the range at the highest that I could see him going. You mentioned the Bills; they're at nine. The Broncos, who you mentioned, could also use a tight end slash wide receiver. But the other two that's interesting are the Jaguars and the Lions, because now Matthew Stafford. I don't know if you would consider him a true strong arm quarterback. But got quite an arm. I do remember back against the uh, Cleveland Browns, I think it was on like a Thanksgiving mm-hmm. game, obliterates his shoulder and still goes out there and chucks it deep. Yeah. Um, so I could see DK maybe working with the Lions. I don't see them drafting a wide receiver, though. The interesting one, though, is because of the injuries that they had last season, because of the wide receivers that they lost, they lost Allen Hearns and Allen Robinson – before last year, the question that I will ask you, now that they're going to mm-hmm. have Nick Foles coming in, do the Jaguars, let's say he has a really good pro day, he does everything right from now until the draft, could the Jaguars be a good fit for DJ Metcalf at the next level? I don't know. I mean, I, I can kind of see it. Uh, at the same time, I think maybe offensive line's a better way to go mm-hmm. for them in that case once they protect, get there. Protect uh, that yeah. big dick found Nick Foles. Exactly. I mean, you gotta if you're gonna invest in the guy, you gotta keep him healthy. Great dead spin article, by the way. Right. That uh, Sean's Wonderful. cousin uh, sent us, who's in who was in our fantasy league. Yeah. Uh, that was just fantastic. <laughs> uh, I loved every second of it. Uh, but anyways, yeah, I, mm-hmm. I just I think that they would be better off getting the protection because you're going to make that big of an investment. But mm-hmm. you might want to say, well, if you're going to make that big of an investment, go get him somebody to throw the ball to, yep. which is fair too. But in that case, I think you would probably want somebody who can do a little bit more than, than DK Metcalf can mm-hmm. do. Um, and, you know, for, for Nick Foles, yes, the guy's got a good arm, but I, I think he has a little bit, He's going to play a different game than, like, a Josh Allen's going to play. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I don't think it completely lines up. And yeah, and then, like, the rest of it is just, like, the Bills and Broncos, I agree with you. The Bills might be the best fit just because Josh Allen, he was yeah. balling. He was slinging those bombs at mm-hmm. the Combine last year. Throw, throw it slightly past the wide receiver just yeah. to show you just, that he can. Just to make sure, hey, I got that cannon right here that's attached to my arm. Broncos will be interesting because, like you even mentioned, and I'm going out of order here because we recorded the podcast Mm -hmm. out of order. Um, When we get to the Pat segment at the end, you even mentioned what kind of a Joe Flacco are we going to see from the Denver Broncos. Outside outside of that top 10, though, it becomes sketchy because, like, the next teams that are listed with wide receivers, the Redskins, I don't think, take a wide receiver. Like, I think the Redskins— 
unless they get some type of free agent or someone in free agency that they're happy with, I think they're going to be forced to take like a Drew Locke or a Daniel Jones or whoever's the top quarterback available at 15 if they don't trade up. Just because who do they got? Unless they're I, okay. I don't, I don't believe. And I lo- think they'll get somebody in free agency. And unless just say, they're eh. okay with like a Met Mark Sanchez and just be like, hey, fucking do it. We're, we're giving you the keys for this season mm-hmm. just to be, what if they're the team that brings Johnny Manziel back? And gives him the reins this year. I mean, you could have like a Fitzpatrick or something mm-hmm. like that. I mean, he's a guy who goes and shows he can do something. Because they're even talking about maybe Johnny Manziel being on an NFL team Johnny this Manziel's year now. not coming back. The other teams, the Browns that I had DK Metcalf going in our mm-hmm. um, last mock draft, That like the rest of them are like, okay, I think he goes before this if he is. Like the Browns, the Titans, and then after that it's like the Colts. Um, Ravens, I think he's off the board by that time. Potentially. I, it all comes down to as well. We have a lot of really good defensive talent in this draft. Mm-hmm. So if that goes up, if quarterbacks yeah. do start to get taken, then, yeah, he'll probably fall a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, So there's still a lot that can happen. Definitely for sure. The one thing I will ask you, and this will be the last thing, and I know it has nothing to do mm-hmm. with DK, um, one guy that you mentioned in the first segment, yeah, Miles Boykin. Oh yeah, does he crack? Like, does he find himself a late first round guy based off of his combine performance? I I can go ahead and spoil it. He's gonna be in my my first round okay. for for mock draft five <laughs> I, I I'm very I was very happy with what I saw out of the guy. Mark's like I am for sure. He will be there. Gonna be putting him in the. First At number round. one overall to the Arizona Cardinals. <laughs> and that mock draft is going to come out in two weeks' time. We'll be talking about our next mock draft, 4.0. Hopefully uh, after some free agents 5.0. sign as well. Is it really 5.0? Yep. No We've way. done four. Damn. We've done a lot. 5.0 already. Damn. And we did it way too early. 5.0. Really? Our sixth mock draft of the year. Really after that, though, we've got what? Like After that 5.0, you and me have one more. Then for the website, I have my full seven rounder, mm-hmm. and then we've got the the one I love doing, the combined uh, MVP one, yeah. where uh, each of us takes a hodgepodge of teams and kind of works trades with one another and uh, plays GM. So I can't wait for that to happen um, later this year in April. But let us know what you guys are thinking down below. First off, what did you think of DK Metcalf's combine performance? Were you all over the 40, all over his physicals, all over the bench? Or are you like Mark saying, hey, all that stuff is great, but he didn't have a good cone and he didn't have a good shuttle time. Let's not give him a complete pass. Also, because of this situation with Marquise Hollywood Brown, does this now make DK, DK Metcalf the top wide receiver off the board when we get to the NFL draft. Let us know what you guys are thinking down below in that comment section. But Mark, let's move into, I'm just going to say it, our final topic. I know it's not our final topic, but we're recording these out of order. And this is the last one. It's our third of our fourth topic. It's our third of our fourth if you're listening um, Mm -hmm. all the way through. But before I get into what we're going to talk about, make sure if you're on YouTube, this is a YouTube only thing. I am sorry for audio listeners, but if you're on YouTube, Go ahead and hit that bell. Usually we don't have four topics, so I don't have four things to promote. So uh, here's your fourth thing. Uh, go ahead and hit that bell. You'll get the last one. Actually, about half pick. of our year we have four topics. Do we? Well, yeah, you're right. You're yeah. right because of the picks. And now the, a- the AAF, as I keep right. wanting to call it. The Alliance. The AFL. Um, but go ahead and hit that bell to keep up to date on everything for MVP, especially because I found something out about YouTube. Mm-hmm. Um, apparently... If you post more than three things in a 24-hour span, it will only notify your viewers about the first three. Makes sense. So if there's something like the Rick and Johnny today was the fourth one, you probably didn't get an update about that one. But you will if you hit that bell on our YouTube channel. But, Mark, we're talking about a topic that we haven't talked about on this podcast before, right? Never. Like a team that we've never talked about with the draft in the Arizona Cardinals and a guy that we've never talked about going to this team in Kyler Murray. Am I right? Yeah. yeah. Nudge, nudge, wink, and wink. I, and my, my point still stands. 
well, still stands. So what we're getting into is I know that we talked about that we mentioned this during our 4.0 mock draft. Sean, Dave, and I talked about the Cardinals trading for Antonio Brown last week. And about a month ago, February 1st, we talked about who this team could take at number one. But an NFL combine happened. So Kyler Murray, his measurables come out. He's over 5'10". He's 5'10". And what, an eighth would that be? Yeah, um, he, was, point he was standing on his tippy toes, you know. His hands were a good size. His measurables were good. Everything kind of laid out. So now there's rumors that the Cardinals are saying, hey, screw it. We're going to probably take you with the number one overall pick. I am going to ask you, Mark, for the millionth time on this yep. podcast and definitely not the last, should the Cardinals draft Kyler Murray with the first overall pick? No. You got a quarterback. You drafted a quarterback 12th overall last I, year. I love the emphatic no. It's just you drafted a quarterback 12th overall. Um, I, I get that you've you've got a really, the I think, the only coach that can probably get success out of Kyler Murray in uh-huh. the NFL. Uh, yet I don't even think that he's the coach is going to have success in the NFL. Yet again, we had a topic of did they mess up by hiring Cliff Kingsbury. Right? Man, if you're an Arizona Cardinals fan, you hate us because we keep having negative things to say, but you love the coverage. Yeah, you I, guys get talked about I, a lot. I feel bad for uh, Brian Lutes. Yeah, uh, really. Throwing it, throwing it back, Brian Lutes. I haven't seen him in the comments section recently. Yeah, where you been at? <laughs> uh, but, um, you know... It's it's just to me. You already drafted a quarterback. Mm -hmm. Your team has so many needs. To get a Bosa is a huge deal Uh for that defense. That would be such a good improvement. Um, And Kyler Murray, yes, his hand bigger than I thought it was. All right, cool. He's going to do all right. I said the over under was five ninth and a half, and I said under. Boy, was I wrong. You were wrong. you know, he was a little bit taller than we expected. Uh, was he, though? I think he was right on with most people. Most people had him mm. at 5'10". Yeah. And that's pretty much and where he landed. Uh, <laughs> he has an eighth. And, you know, his, his hand is bigger than Baker Mayfield's. The one thing that I do wonder mm-hmm. about, though, is he, his weight. He came in heavier than I expected, which I was yeah. like, cool. I'm pleasantly surprised by that. Mm-hmm. That kind of took something away. But his frame is built differently mm-hmm. to where I'm like, is he weighed? I think like two hundred seven pounds or something like that. Is he actually going to be two hundred seven pounds when it comes to game day, mm-hmm. or is that some water weight? And he ate a lot of pasta, and that's why he didn't want to run and throw. Because mm-hmm. if he ran and throw, people would realize, ooh, he's a little bit slower now than he used to because of all that water and pasta. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, but I I'm just kind of going off on something. But to me, it's just purely I I get it. Kyler Murray is such a kind of controversial topic uh, for for what he can do in the NFL. I just don't see it working. I really don't. Uh, His team was built to be a team where he could just sling it all day, uh, and those defenses can't keep up with what the defenses in the NFL has. When he gets pressure, he performs very badly. Well, And that's what I was going to say. He was a guy that very rarely was under pressure because he played – Behind one of the best, if not the best, yep. offensive line in all of college football. If he goes to Arizona, he is not going to have that same luxury. No. Not re- at all. Remember when I talked about uh, playing them in a franchise and was like, yep. holy crap, that O-line sucks. Exactly. There's a reason. Well, there's multiple reasons. But there's a reason why Josh Rosen did not do very well uh-huh. last year. Part of it's that offensive line is terrible. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, remember, the Chicago Bears uh, kind of ended Sam Bradford. Uh, because remember, mm-hmm. Sam Bradford was the quarterback for the Arizona Cardinals at one point this year, and then the ginger giraffe. Uh, I don't know. He never got. A, he never actually got to play. But he's on the roster. He is. He never got to play though. <laughs> uh, I don't think he did. At least, but yeah, Chicago Bears ended roster. him. Uh, ended Sam Bradford. Um, but anyways, I I just I fear for Kyle, Kyler Murray's mm-hmm. long term success. And people are saying, yeah, but you know, people have criticized. Because we're talking about, and I'm sure you're going to get to the quotes mm-hmm. at some point. We're talking about certain quotes of what GM said. Well, people like, yeah, but people complained about Cam Newton. People complained mm-hmm. about Lamar Jackson and Josh Rosen. And it's like, yes, but Cam Newton is built way differently mm-hmm. than Kyler Murray cool. is. Lamar Jackson, I'm still afraid he's going to get hurt. Mm-hmm. And he uh, kind of got shown a little bit by the Chiefs, or not Chiefs, the Chargers. And then Rosen, that's the guy that you're saying you should replace with Kyler Murray. Mm-hmm. So why is he a good comparison? 
Well, and I'll throw those quotes out right now. And I'm mm-hmm. looking at the – this is from the New York Post. And they have quotes from – the first one is from Charlie Casserly, who was a former longtime NFL executive. He said a few things. The first thing he said was he better hope Kingsbury takes him number one because this was not good. There were or These were the worst comments talking about the – Comments about Kyler Murray. These were the worst comments I ever got on a high-rated quarterback, and I've been doing this a long time. Um, And Cassidy was formerly the GM of the Redskins and the Texans and is now an NFL um, network analyst. He went on to say leadership, not good. Study habits, not good. The board work, below not good. Not good at all in any of those areas raising major concerns about what this guy is going to do. And he went on to say, now people will say we're going to compare him to Patrick Mahomes. We're going to run an offense like Mahomes. We're going to run an offense like Baker Mayfield. But these guys are much different. These guys, you never question them about their ability on the board. Um, You never question their leadership ability, their work habit. They were outstanding in those areas. This guy is not outstanding in those areas And it showed up in the interview. And the thing I'm going to say about that last part first, Patrick Mahomes was a guy that we were, I know you and I, I know me for sure, I was surprised when the Chiefs traded up because I was like, oh, okay. Didn't expect Patrick Mahomes to go this high. Yeah. Um, I mean, he's playing like he deserved to be drafted that high. Even Baker Mayfield was like his football ability – Never really questioned it, besides maybe, like, the same thing we're saying about Kyler, of, like, the height. But, like, for me, it was the— And the the, small hand. And the small hand. But for me, it was more off-the-field stuff, where it was, like, the—when he got into the run-in with the cop, with the flipping flipping off the Kansas Jayhawk team, the—all of that antics, that's what I kind of was raising a hoopla about with Baker Mayfield— I don't think it's a good sign, though, when you've got a former GM saying that this guy's not a good leader, is not a good study, like he's not going to study your playbook, basically, is what I'm seeing. And then number two, his board work is not good. Where I will go back to this. There was a documentary that I saw where Jacoby Brissett was talking about the first day he stepped in with Tom Brady um, in that Patriot locker room. And he goes, yeah, you know, McDaniels asked me a question before I could open my mouth. Tom answered it. And he goes, the first thought I had was, what the hell are you doing? He asked me the question. And McDaniels looked right at Brissett and said, you got to be that quick. If you ain't that quick, you're never going to make it. So, I mean, if I'm not expecting him to be Tom Brady, but it's like, if you're not even good with the board work in the room – are you even going to pan out as a quarterback in the NFL? And like you've always said, how quickly is he going to go to baseball once it gets hard? Yeah, I definitely think that's a very real potential still. He was so noncommittal about which sport he was going to mm-hmm. play uh, for the longest time. And he finally, after having an agent, uh, decided to say, I'm going to play football, which mm-hmm. wasn't really that surprising. Uh, to test it out and get some money. Because he can get a nice fat paycheck early. Mm -hmm. But as soon as things get tough, he might just kind of flip-flop his way back to playing baseball. I I look at Kyler Murray and and especially some of the the interviews we've seen with him, um, like the Dan Patrick Mm -hmm. interview. It's you got to bring it up, and I know people got mad at us for it, but you have to bring it up. It was bad. It was terrible. It was worse than bad. He was just so incredibly awkward on there. He did not know how to respond. Mm-hmm. He didn't know how to answer. And I sit there, and I'm like, yeah, his job is not answering questions, and I'm not even really that concerned about the um, the conferences after the press conferences. And but even- I, I just look at it, and I say, if that's how he was on this radio mm-hmm. show— how is he going to impress any GMs and scouts when yeah. they talk to him? Well, and Dan Patrick, like Dan Patrick, as an interviewer, mm-hmm. he's not a guy that you can walk into and go, "Oh, this is going to be an easy interview." I'm yeah. gonna- no, he's a guy that is going to ask the tough questions. Like, did your friends come to your birthday party? Basically, yeah. Um, but he is going to ask those questions where, hey, it's like he's not going to be a douche, but he's not going to like. It's not like a hey, this is a cupcake kind of an interviewer. Like, mm-hmm. he is one of the best interviewers 
in our business. And that is why his basically his whole entire show, except for the part where he is talking to the Danettes about something, most of his show is, hey, I've got Reggie on talking about basketball. I'm interviewing Reggie. Hey, I've got Mel Kuyper on. Yeah. I'm interviewing Mel about the draft. It's like most of his show is interviews because that's his best skill. Mm-hmm. So it's like you couldn't like you come up to that show with that weak stuff. Like but get that weak shit. It's out also of here. if and that's I know what people are gonna get mad that I just said. If that. That's what Dan Patrick was saying. Mm-hmm. What do you think the GMs are gonna ask you the when harder, you're in the room? Yeah, harder stuff. And and are you going to impress them? Because you have to impress doors. them. And and the the idea here is that if you kind of fall under pressure, mm-hmm. uh, mental pressure, when the questions are tough, what do you do when a few things when you get actual pressure in an NFL game mm-hmm. uh, from t- opposing teams, which we've already seen hasn't done very well against that. Uh, but then the fact too of how about when the game gets tough. How are mm-hmm. you going to handle under the pressure then? Uh, are you going to freeze up? Because he froze up in an interview for that. But the other thing, too, and I know people might think we're making a little bit of a jump on that. I'll admit that. But um, the other thing, too, is how about when it just gets tough? Like I said, the guy froze up when the team is not doing well. When people are sitting there going, really? We got rid of Josh Rosen for this guy? Because, I don't know, maybe Josh Rosen goes to another team and maybe he's successful. Uh, or maybe he's not and he's just sitting on your bench and you're wondering... Well, we drafted him 12th overall. Why don't we give him a shot? Mm-hmm. Um, does that pressure make Kyler Murray go, I don't know, baseball's looking kind of good. Maybe I go play over there because I was going to be a pretty good player over there. I, I just think that it's just too – it is too risky still. And I sit there and to answer our original question with the Cardinals, with the number one overall pick, I know I've said before that sometimes when you need a quarterback, you go for you go for that quarterback because you never have a chance to get any guy you want. You already had a chance to get the guy you want last year, and you grabbed him. You're really going to jump on and say, no, that was a mistake, and take a risky pick that easily could fizzle out of the NFL in like two, three years? Mm-hmm. With and he's very he's going to be very attached to Kingsbury. If Kingsbury fails in the NFL. Then Kyler Murray's gone because I don't think very many other coaches are going to want to come in here and say, "Yeah, I'll, I'll work with Kyler Murray." They're going to want more of a prototypical type of quarterback mm-hmm. instead of the undersized guy. Um, I just think it's way too risky to do with a first overall pick when you can do something like I don't know, take a Bosa. Well, and that I'm going to get into that in a second, but like you bring up Kingsbury, like if you take Kyler Murray and he doesn't pan out, not only do like. I would think not only does Kingsbury lose his job, but, and I'm going to screw up his name, does Steve Keim also lose his job as the GM? Mm-hmm. And the reason Probably. why I'm unsure about that GM part uh-huh. is because, so Keim has been the GM with the Cardinals since, so January of 2013, he gets hired as the GM. About, what, eight days later on my birthday that year, January 17th, Hires Bruce Arians to be the head coach of the Cardinals. Things are going well for a while. Things are going really well for a while. Like he comes, he comes in as GM. They're ten and six, eleven and five, thirteen and three under Bruce Arians. Then seven, eight and one. Then eight and eight. Then they get rid of Bruce Arians. He's gone. Yep. The second guy you hire as your GM is Steve Wilkes to be that coach. head coach. Yeah. And you're three and thirteen. So to me, if Kingsbury then, if you guys draft Kyler Murray and that doesn't work out. But you have to remember that you're also the GM that mm-hmm. picked Josh Rosen. Well, so if you go out there and say Josh Rosen was a mistake, mm-hmm. you're making a lot of mistakes well, now. And I was going to bring that up as well. Yeah. It's like what I would think as an owner then is, A, did you just get lucky? Did we just get lucky that Bruce Arians chose us over the Bears? And then number two, how's your decision making been mm-hmm. since that you draft Josh Rosen, then you second guess and draft Kyler Murray, and both of those didn't pan out. Plus the coaches you pick, depending on how Kingsbury does, Wilkes you fired after a year, that ain't good. And Kingsbury, what? Even if he gets two years, it's like you're on a hot. If he's stove not successful, he's coaches. not successful. Yeah. Exactly, and it's like, what are you gonna do? 
if that happens, would Kime also be a guy that leaves he or should. gets fired yeah. with Kingsbury? If Kingsbury he's gets the one fired. that makes the pick. And it's this, to me, it's a situation mm-hmm. of Cliff Kingsbury, you can like Kyler Murray all you want, but you can like him when he's on another team. Yeah. He doesn't have to be on our team for you to like the guy. Mm-hmm. We will go with whichever player makes us the best. And, and that's why I still sit here and think, especially at this time of the year where there's so many smoke screens going around and so many misdirection, I still stand there and say the Arizona Cardinals are trying desperately to get somebody to trade to the number one overall. You think they so? They really, really, really want someone to trade. Because if they're trying to trade Josh Rosen— what team wants to trade for a guy who in one year you've said he sucks so badly that we're taking the guy everybody has questions about? Mm-hmm. We want that guy. Uh, we're taking a risky pick because our other guy we took was so bad. That's concerning. You know, and to where they're saying that teams are saying, well, you know, the, the price for Josh Rosen would be a third overall mm-hmm. pick. A third overall pick for the guy who was drafted 12th overall last year. Trent Richardson got better than that. And where's Trent Richardson Mm -hmm. in the NFL? Um, You know, like, I just had to think that they are doing a terrible job of handling this situation because they are dropping down Josh Rosen's trade value tremendously. They're doing a great job. It's like, to me, there's two teams that I see them getting a, because right now Mm -hmm. they said like the, value a is third. a third round pick. Yep. There's only two teams that would trade now for Josh Rosen with that. Either a team like the Patriots who have three third round picks and can give one and up can just to just sit him on a bench. Yeah, to sit him behind Tom Brady or a team like the Redskins could go, "Oh, we'll give you our third and just have Josh Rosen be our quarterback, then we don't have to take a quarterback mm-hmm. in the first round." Yeah. Like those are to me the only two teams now that you're making a deal with because the topic that we basically talked about last mm-hmm. week um, when you weren't here of them trading Josh Rosen and a third for Antonio Brown, I feel like that's out the window. But here's the killer to me mm-hmm. um, with the Arizona Cardinals is let's say that they are just trying desperately to get someone to trade up to number one overall. Mm-hmm. They have zero intention of ever drafting Kyler Murray. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I hope they had the conversation with Josh Rosen before all this happened to say, like, hey, don't mm-hmm. worry. We're going to say a lot of things, but you're a guy. But to not go out there. They won't even commit in public that he's yeah, the guy. but that's my point. Well, they can't because otherwise then who's going to trade up to number one overall? Yeah. Uh, but that's my point. To not say – to not pull a, uh, you know, a Rex Grossman is my quarterback from Lovey Smith. Mm-hmm. There's a reason why coaches go out there and they say, this guy's my quarterback. This guy's my quarterback. There's no question. This guy's my quarterback. They do that all the time. It's because the co- the confidence level for the quarterback is so important. They need confidence. Especially a guy entering a second year in the NFL. Right? So you have a quarterback in Josh Rosen, if you're going to go with him next year, mm-hmm. who's sitting there thinking, my team doesn't like me. They don't want me. They are trying to replace me. You know, maybe the only reason they don't replace me is because the GM overrules the coach. You know, he is going to feel so bad about his confidence level. And mm-hmm. now you're poisoning the well for your fans, too. Because all your fans are going to get excited about this Kyler Murray thing. And if you don't draft him, it's like, oh, now we're stuck with Josh Rosen. Mm-hmm. It, it's just a terrible job they've kind of done uh, to really hurt the the young quarterback that they have right now in Josh Rosen. Um, I, I just think they're very... Very much are mishandling this situation. See, and I think I think it's easy for the Cardinals. Like, if I was me, and the last thing I'll say about Steve Keim, because I also was like, oh, I wonder, like, who was their quarterback in 2013? Because I couldn't remember. Um, before I say it, do you know who their quarterback was? All in I remember is Carson Palmer. Carson Palmer. Yeah. You want to know how they got him? Through trade. That April, they traded for yeah. him. So that, to me, is I wonder with... If they take Murray and it doesn't pan out, that's why I wonder if mm-hmm. how long will the owner let Kime cling on to that early success of, hey, I got Bruce Arians and I traded for Carson Palmer. We had some good and games And kind of locked into Carson Palmer because exactly. he had a very bad year in Oakland. Exactly. Um, and that's the one thing, like, I feel like this is easy, the easiest thing. If I'm the Cardinals, don't trade the pick, don't draft Kyler Murray, Take Nick Bosa, especially after the combine. Nice and easy. That just happened. You take Nick Bosa, you pair him next to Chandler Jones, 
and you say, screw it. We've got now a defensive line of Chandler Jones is on that offensive line. Nick Bosa is now on that mm-hmm. offensive defensive. line. No, defensive line. Robert Kemdichie is on that defensive line. Mm-hmm. That's what you do. You let someone else worry about Kyler Murray. That's what I'm saying because the whole thing is it's like you said – You haven't said it this year because I feel like because it's more defensive, you haven't said Mm -hmm. so. But like you said about the Browns last year when everyone's like, oh, they're going to take a quarterback. Teams that keep drafting quarterbacks early in the draft, one, usually stay early in the draft. Two, Mm -hmm. they keep drafting quarterbacks early in the draft because they don't – you like. If you miss on them, they don't pan out. You're back in the early draft. There's a reason why you're, and you're early drafting in the draft. a new quarterback because you're not hitting on them. Mm-hmm. Obviously, if you take like an Andrew Luck, boom, you're not early in the draft unless he's injured and you hit on a quarterback. I just feel like you've got Josh Rosen. You're getting David Johnson back off of injury this year. Why not take the best defensive player in this draft at number one? Exactly. And then in your second round pick, take a wide receiver. Make let's the rest say, of the team better. Let's say a, and I know you said you're going to have him in the first round. Let's say a Miles Boykin is there at 33 for some reason. You can take a Miles Boykin at 33 and there. Now we didn't have to trade Josh Rosen for Antonio Brown. And I know a lot of people want the Cardinals to trade for Antonio Brown, but I think that price would be too high than just Josh Rosen and a third, and I wouldn't want to trade Josh Rosen because I don't want to even draft Kyler Murray because if I'm hearing a scout say, if I'm hearing an executive say this, like that's not the only quote. The last one was from a different exec where he was like, um, I saw the interviews during his Super Bowl and they were awful, awful. And to be a legit quarterback, you've got to have leadership qualities like Baker. I know we drafted him in Cleveland, so I'm probably a little biased, but he controls the room. He walks in, and it's like, whoa. Watching Kyler do an interview, it's like, come on, guy. What do you got? Give me something. I'm sure they're going to – they're trying to train him. But the thing is, that is his personality. And that's the thing. Is that just his personality to where Mm. he's not going to be that leader in the locker room? Exactly, and, and you need that. And people have criticized quarterbacks for not being leaders in the locker mm-hmm. room in the past. Uh, they'll and continue how often to do has so. It panned, out, panned out. Yeah, uh, it's an interesting situation here for the Cardinals because they've made it kind of more difficult on themselves than it needs to be. Mm-hmm. Um, really, if anything, they should be at, telling people, "Do you do you guys want a chance to get a Bosa?" Because mm-hmm. I can show you a good Bosa in the NFL right now. Yeah, look at the You Chargers. can have one right here. Yeah. Trade for the number one pick for that. Mm-hmm. You know, Kyler Murray, I, I think they're barking up the wrong tree to try and get someone to trade up for Kyler mm-hmm. Murray. I think there's enough people who are, are not interested. Yeah, it's just it's interesting to where I would feel like in the last thing I would say, and before I ask you the answer, which I know your answer already, but just to give a solidified, yeah. my final answer would be no. Don't draft Kyler Murray number one. I would even say no, don't trade the pick unless you're getting like a king's ransom mm-hmm. for that pick. I would take Nick Bosa. Or yeah, Nick Bosa at number one. Yeah, Joe's I've, for in I've, San Diego. I've said the wrong Bosa name or so many times LA. that now I say the right one and I still second guess myself. But I would take Nick Bosa at number one and just be happy with that pick. What would yeah. what would be your final answer with the question of should the Cardinals Take Kyler Murray at number one. Nope. Just plain and nope. simple. Just don't take. Don't would, do it. Same thing. Taking Nick Bosa. I, I yeah. That's your that's your best thing to do. Is just take him. I mean, if you like you said, if you can get the Kings ransom, and you might because he's a very talented player, mm-hmm. uh, and his brother is very talented too. Uh, sure, you could you could trade it then, but just you need to hit mm-hmm. on a really high pick. You don't want to take risks. Just go draft the guy who is going to be a sure thing. Yeah, and the interesting thing to me is the Cardinals, I think, no one's going to trade up to number one for. The 49ers, no one's going to trade there. The big one to me, and whether we do this next week as a segment or we hold it off until the mock draft, it's really the Jets. They're the one where it's like they if Kyler Murray's mm-hmm. available, that's the pick that I'm trading up to. I'm not trading up Maybe. to one, not trading up to two. 
I'll trade up to three, four. But this is where you guys come in. Let us know what you guys think down below in that comment section. If you're the Cardinals GM, if you're in that front office, are you taking Kyler Murray number one? If you're a Cardinals fan, do you even want the Cardinals to take Kyler Murray, I almost said Josh Rosen, Kyler Murray, number one overall, or would you stick with Nick Bosa or even a Quinn and Williams, somebody that we did not mention? Let us know what you guys are thinking down below in the comment section. But, Mark, let's move on into our final topic. And before we get into everything, before I introduce the guests that we've got on, I should say returning guests um, that we have coming back, make sure to check out patreon.com backslash most valuable podcast. That is how you can help support the podcast. We obviously cannot do what we do each and every week without the help of our wonderful patrons. And with that being said, we are welcomed today by one of those wonderful patrons who supports us at the $10 tier. You can be the same if you do so as well. Pat Hill calling in. And of course, Pat wants to talk about his Chicago Bears. But before I set up the segment, Pat, how are you doing this evening on this wonderful kind of chilly Tuesday? Oh, I'm doing well, considering it's actually a lot colder down here. So this morning I walked outside and it was like three degrees outside. So my face froze and it took me a good hour to unfreeze my face. So other than that, it was a great day today. (laughs) Yeah, Mark and I were complaining about the cold um, before we were coming in today. But you want to talk about the Chicago Bears and really you want to ask the question of will the Bears regress in 2019? They had a year that... Mark had him, I believe, like ten and six, nine and seven after the Khalil Mack trade. But that was I, I going Wild in. I was spot like, in the playoffs. I was like, you know what? Mm-hmm. That's a Bears fan is going to do that. I had him at like seven and nine, eight and eight. Still weren't buying in on him. They exceeded expectations, winning the division, having a great year, going to the playoffs, getting that first game as a home game in the playoffs. I'm just going to kick it to you though to start this segment off. Do you think the Bears are going to regress in 2019, Pat? It's hard for me to, like, I think I I have a sinking feeling that they will. And that really, that feeling comes from knowing that this year, like, went so well. And the Bears got really lucky in a lot of regards regarding they had a really favorable schedule where they got a lot of good teams at home and they won those games. Um, They got really lucky with their injuries. They did have injuries to, like, Robinson, Mack. They had injuries to other guys, but... They were able to, during those times they had injuries, they were playing bad teams, and they were able to rest those guys and win those games despite those injuries. But I felt like a lot went right for the Bears this season. And But, but looking on paper, the Bears should be fine. But like thinking about next season, including next year's schedule, which is way more difficult, where you have more home games against really tough teams and away games against better teams, and also considering like the division about the Lions had a the, the Lions did not have a good seat first year under Matt Patricia. The Vikings, we know, took a step back, and the Packers were just kind of a jumbled mesh. I think it's really hard for me to say that the Bears will progress next season when knowing that all three teams in our division went, had a lot going wrong for them. We had a lot going right, and I don't think next year is going to happen for is going to have the same amount of luck for the Bears. So I have that thinking feeling that with all those factors, they are going to regress next season. Well, I think that. Uh, the thing that needs to kind of be put out there is, of course, the Bears are going to regress. They were a 12-4 and four team. They had the best defense in the NFL, and they had a top-10 offense. They should regress. I mean, they should uh, because you look at this team, and, of course, they are bringing back a lot of core players, but they're going to start getting to that point fairly soon where players have to get paid. Uh, Kyle Long had to restructure his contract to free up some cap space for the Bears to spend money and keep him around because he otherwise he was going to be probably cut this offseason. Uh, you're looking into a future where you got to make decisions about really key players like Amukamura. You're going to make player uh, decisions about guys like Amos. There's a lot of players that are going to either this season, next offseason, have decisions need to be made. Mm-hmm. Uh but you look at this team, like I said, it's a top of the line defense. Lose a defensive coach. Pagano's going to come in. The team might still be fine, but there's a little bit of an adjustment period, a, bit, a little bit of learning for that. The offense was learning for a good chunk of this season. And, you know, we saw really great uh, highlights and really great kind of shining moments, especially as the season kind of started to move along. Things were starting to look really good. And there were things that you sit there and you're like, well, why don't we ever 
you know, use Jordan Howard, for mm-hmm. example. Uh, you know, there's things like that that were question marks too, and we'll see how things continue to develop under this. But they were a 12-4 and four team, so yeah, they're going to lose more games next year than they lost this year, I'm sure. You, I look at some of these other teams, though, and Detroit, I hate to do this to the fans of the Detroit Lions, but I'm not scared of the Detroit Lions. Mm-hmm. I thought Matt Patricia was a bad hire. I, I didn't get it, and I, I'm not scared of him always there. I, I mean, especially mm-hmm. the rumors how, like, now there are rumors like, oh, should, should, should the Lions uh, trade Matthew Stafford and kind of go with a lesser, like, trade mm-hmm. for a Case Keenum while they maybe bring they can someone in? Make a deal, get a Josh Rosen. But, <laughs> maybe. Uh, you know, Green Bay, Green Bay is a question mark to mm-hmm. me because I, I don't believe um, they made a good hire in coach either. Uh, although Aaron Rodgers is really the one that's in control, so we'll see what happens with that. Minnesota's a big question mark to me as well, but a, well, I should say it's a smaller question mark than Green Bay, but it's still a question mark in are they are we going to see the Green Bay that had an effective offense mm-hmm. when they switched offensive coordinators, or are we going to see mediocrity out of it's the Trish, Matt, um with uh, what's his name Kirk, the Matt Lafleur question mark too. Yeah. Of what is that going to bring? Um, I just, with me, with the division, I will, no matter what, always at the beginning of the year, it could play out how it did, but I will always say a prediction for the NFC North is give me a split against the Vikings, split against the Packers, two wins against the Lions. That's what I come in every year because the Packers and Vikings – Although the Vikings didn't live up to the expectations I wanted them to be, I always feel like they're tough games. Same with the Packers. They always play the Bears tough, and the Bears play them tough as well. Yeah, and the other thing, too, um, uh, I got to throw it out there. Mm-hmm. You know, they, The Vikings played the Bears tough one of these games, not the other one. Uh, but, uh, well, that last game was – let's not talk about that Week 17 game. It was, it was done. They were ready to, to go on vacation. Uh, and anyways, but yeah, I mean, when I, when I look at this team, even if they do regress, they should still be a playoff team Mm -hmm. and, and that's okay to me. You know, they don't have to be 12 and four. They can still be a 10 and six team getting the playoffs. Well, I'll ask you, Pat, and I'm going to throw this your way. If they do regress, are they going to regress to where, like Mark said, are they still going to be a playoff team or could you see this team regressing? to where they just missed the playoffs in the NFC? I feel like they would be more of the playoff last spot in the team if they were to regress, because I think uh, they still have, they do have enough talent on the team to kind of sustain them. And I agree with a lot of the points that we've, that you guys have talked about that there's, they, the regressing doesn't mean out of the playoffs. The only way I can see them not making the playoffs is if, there's a huge amount of injuries. Either the offense just doesn't progress one bit and the defense just falls off a cliff. And I, the only, my only concern about the defense was, I think I read an article last week that talked about the Bears put a lot of emphasis on how many, how many turnovers they had. But this article kind of argued that turnovers is not really a sustainable stat in the NFL. Like you can maybe sustain sacks, but you can't sustain turnovers for a year-to-year basis. And that's how a lot of, that's how a lot of games were won by the Bears. So that can that one right there kind of gave me concern. Like maybe the Bears, the Bears defense is still going to be a great defense, but maybe they're just not going to have that game changing effect on the game that they had this past season. And so a lot of the onus is going to be on Mitch Trubisky and the offense to, according to Matt Nagy, like really start playing ball and really get better. But I would still see them as maybe not the division winner, which would be really disappointing. But maybe it's like that last spot playoff team where they'll have to go somewhere to play a wild card game. So that's where I see the bears next season. If they were to regress. Yeah. And right now, the big thing for me is I'm looking at the schedule and just to go over it, the home games for the bears, obviously it also depends on how many of these are going to be like back to back road games. And do the bears have something ridiculous where wasn't mm-hmm. the Thanksgiving one where they played the they played late game three on games Sunday in like 11 days. Yeah. Like they played like the late that's game on NFL Sunday. <laughs> And yeah. then they had to go and play Thanksgiving. And the Bears do play in London this year. They do. Um, but the opponents that they have are the ones that are listed as home games, because I can't remember which one's the London game. Maybe you remember, Mark. Um, but they have, obviously, Lions, Bears, Vikings, home and away. Then the home opponents are Dallas, 
the New York Giants, the Chiefs, Chargers, and Saints, and then the road opponents are the Redskins, the Raiders. Which I think is the London game. The Redskins th- is the no, London game? No, I think game? it's the Raiders. Okay. Yeah, so the Raiders. The Redskins, Raiders, you, good thing for the Bears. They lose yeah. a road game um, to London. Because Oakland doesn't have any home yeah. games anywhere this um, year. So. <laughs> then you've got the Eagles, the Broncos, and the Los Angeles Rams. And really quickly, kind of while Pat was um, giving his answer about would they regress out of the playoffs, I am very – and I get that this is going to change because the draft – need. well, first off, free agency needs to happen. The draft needs to happen. And then, of course – Training camp needs to happen before these become official. But kind of jotting down initially where I see wins and losses with the division, I'm doing the same thing that I said before, is that I'm giving you two wins against the Lions, a win against the Packers, win against the Vikings, and I'm giving you a loss against the Vikings and the Packers. I know that you beat the Vikings twice last year. I just always do that for the NFC um, North when it comes to the Bears. Then the other teams that I think are automatic wins based off of last year. I'm going to say the Giants because although you lost to them last year, that was in New York. You get them in Chicago this time. The Raiders, I mean, really the Bears should be able to beat the Raiders unless it's like, hey, the London game screwed us up and the Raiders got to win. And then the Redskins because who the hell is going to be their quarterback next year? Those are the ones that automatically I penciled down as wins. So right away, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven wins off the bat. I also gave you seven losses off the bat, and some you guys might disagree with. The Saints, Chargers, and Chiefs. I know they're all at home. I like those three teams a lot better than I do um, the Bears. Not saying they're going to be blowouts, but I give those losses to the Bears. The Eagles, because looking at the playoffs – you lose to the Eagles at home. Now you get them on the road. But that would probably in my be mind, inspiration, I would imagine. Maybe, and that's the thing. If it's inspiration, that one could be flipped. And then the Rams, because yes, you beat the Rams at home, but playing in L.A., is that going to be different? Plus with the Rams, how are they going to treat their Super Bowl hangover with losing how they did yep. um, to the Patriots? Then obviously the Vikings and the Packers. The two games, and I believe there's only two that I'm missing on, and I'll ask you guys, Pat, I'll go to you first, is the two opponents that I don't know how to gauge are the Broncos, because although John Elway can't talk about it, they will be adding Joe Flacco this year, and then the Dallas Cowboys, because they're just two teams where they're kind of, I feel like they're going to be right in the middle kind of teams, and I don't know how those two teams are going to match up with the Bears what would you think about those two, Broncos and Cowboys, and how the Bears will fare against those two new opponents this year, Pat? So judging by the schedule and judging by where we play and how the teams are, I would go, this might be controversial, but I would go win against the Broncos, and I would go loss against the Cowboys just for right now because for me the Cowboys and the Bears play very similar styles, and they both they both have good defenses. You know, Dak Prescott and Mitch Trubisky have been, like, kind of judged as, like, they can run, but then maybe they can't be, like, the passers that you need to be excel in the NFL. And they both have – their offenses are different, but they both have really good pieces. And I kind of see that game coming out to Prescott and Trubisky, just far out, but them struggling to get anything going and the defense is kind of taking over. But I kind of see Dallas with Ezekiel Elliott, assuming he's playing, assuming he's healthy, kind of taking that game over. And the Broncos, I just think that they're, they they also have a strong defense, but they don't have that strong offense to me. So I feel like well, going to Denver, despite being in a road conditions, I still feel like the Bears pull that one off because I just don't think their offense can overcome what their defense can bring. And Mark, before you give your answer, if I put it in just like mm-hmm. Pat said, that would mean my win and loss for the Bears would be 8-8 eight and eight for next season. From what Pat said? Yeah. So if I put Broncos as a win, Cowboys as a loss, I'm giving the Bears an 8-8 eight and eight season next year based off of the schedule that I see. For me, I, I first think it's I, I, I first think that the LA Chargers, um, I don't think that's a for sure loss at all. I don't think I don't think the Saints are a for sure loss either. The in the playoffs, most people agreed that 
the team that had the best chance, and this is surprising because, of course, you know, we know what happened to the Saints. Mm-hmm. The team with the best chance of beating the Saints was the Chicago Bears. Yeah. Um, and I, I still think they match up against the Saints just fine, but I would still count that as a loss. The Chargers is the one that I think that the Bears could could beat. The Chargers, I mean, they're always a team that's a little inconsistent. Well, if Lamar I Jackson could almost beat the Chargers, why can't Mitch Trubisky, right? right? And I bolt <laughs> up. Uh, but anyways, when it comes to the teams you were actually asking about, uh, to me, I still I think the Philadelphia Eagles, I think that can be a win because of the inspiration. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think that has a big effect. But even if you count it as a loss, uh, I think that Denver Broncos – Yes, the Denver Broncos are a better team with Joe Flacco, but we still need to see Joe Flacco play. I mean, is it mm-hmm. going to be what we all assumed with Jay Cutler going to Miami? Like, yeah, this makes sense. He played well with, <laughs> with Adam Gase. And then Jay Cutler was like, no, nah, I'm ready for retirement. I'm just here for the paycheck. <laughs> uh, Joe Flacco could easily be the same thing. He got benched last year to a guy who really was not a good passer. Uh, he was just good with his feet. And – got completely shut down by the Chargers. Um, so, with that being said, uh, I think the Bears can beat the Denver Broncos, uh, although I think the Denver Broncos could potentially make some interesting decisions um, in the draft, which might make them a much better team. The other one is going to be for the Dallas Cowboys, especially with this being a home game, I'm really not scared of the Dallas Cowboys if I'm mm-hmm. a Bears fan because the Bears had the best rushing defense in the NFL. And what did the Dallas Cowboys do really well? Run the ball with Zeke. Mm -hmm. And every year, that offensive line, which was once so great, gets a little bit worse Mm -hmm. because pieces get a little chipped off, players get moved somewhere else. I wouldn't be scared. I wouldn't be that scared of Dak Prescott. He can make things happen, but I wouldn't be that scared about him. The thing that scares me about the Cowboys is just Dak Prescott. Or I'm sorry, it's just Ezekiel, uh, Ezekiel Elliott. And like I said, Bears do just fine shutting down runners. Um, I mean, they were like well over halfway through the season before they finally let a running, uh, running back score mm-hmm. a touchdown. Um, I really think the Bears could probably be with this schedule a ten and six team. Mm-hmm. Well, and that's really, I mean, obviously, like you said, a lot Chargers, of things have to happen. For Chargers, Chiefs, and Saints—they're not like all right for sure losses. Mm-hmm. I just favor those teams. Anything can happen. Depending on where it is in the season, what injuries have happened, there's obviously a lot of factors. But of course, everyone likes to look at the schedule right away and go, all right, that's a win, that's a loss, this is another win. Ooh, we could be a 12 and 14. We could be a f- screw it. We're 16 and 0 next year. Super Bowl Super Bowl. Usually are. Um but <laughs> the other thing I will ask, and this kind of goes into me of the regression, and I will throw this your way first, Pat is to me the draft is going to be very, very important to the Bears only because they do not have that first-round pick because obviously they gave it up for Khalil Mack. And Bears fans probably aren't sitting there going, oh, man, I wish we had that pick. No, Mm -hmm. you're happy you had Khalil Mack this year. But for you, how important is the Bears draft strategy in order to not regress? because they don't have that first round pick this year. I think it is important because I think you need to have depth at certain positions. And I would, if I were to pick, I would say like the offensive line stayed mostly healthy, mostly healthy with the exception of Kyle Long. So you have to account for that. A lot of people keep saying that they need a running back this year to fit the scheme of Matt Nagy. But to be honest, I'm, I don't really agree with that. Because I think that despite Jordan Howard struggling last year and people making a big deal about how he's not a scheme fit, I think a guy with that kind of talent, you can still find a way, even though his scheme is not a perfect man, I still still feel like you can find a way to maximize his talent. Mm -hmm. And I don't think you just get rid of a talented running back just because he's just not a scheme fit. If you go into the season and he's still struggling, maybe you consider that, but I don't think you give up after one season. I think we, at Bears fans, we learned that with Greg Olson after mm-hmm. letting him go because he wasn't Mike Martz's fit, and that didn't turn out well. But we're so far back in the in the draft that I guess we can, we can maybe find one impact player who can get some time if a player's injured. But I would say it, it was more of like shoring up the O-line, adding more guys in the secondary for positions, especially quarterbacks since – Mukamara is getting older. Kyle Fuller's not super, not old yet, but he's getting there. 
And even though people like really trashed the defensive backs this year for not performing well at the combine, I still think you can maybe find a couple guys in there to help shore up that back end, especially with the questions regarding Bryce Callahan and Adrian Amos. They both might be back. One might be back, but we don't know that yet. So I still think that's important. What do you think of Mark? Um, I'm actually not super worried about it because where, uh, where Ryan Pace has been most effective has been in the middle of the draft. Mm-hmm. It's where you got guys like Eddie Jackson, Tariq Cohen. Um, you know, he's been very, very successful in that kind of middle area of finding those gems. And you got to credit the scouts for it. I mean, Ryan Pace was a scout uh, before too. So these are guys who feel comfortable in that position. Um, I'm not really worried about them not having a first round pick for this because to me, Khalil Mack is worth the trade. Uh, It's worth not having that because who are you going to draft? That's going to be giving you more production on the defense side of the ball than Khalil Mack. So I'm not worried about that case. And sure. It'd be nice to have a first round pick, but then we don't have Khalil Mack. Mm -hmm. Um, So I'm okay. I'm all right with it. Uh, I am. I'm very excited. I do hope that there's something spent in the offensive line. Uh, I agree with that. And as much as I love Kyle Long and he's a bear forever and all of that, he is having trouble staying on the field. So you got to get some something figured out there. Um, I would love to, you know, go for more pass rushers in the draft too. Mm-hmm. That'd be phenomenal. I actually am not opposed to the Bears going out and getting this as a wide receiver Mm -hmm. too. Uh, A young wide receiver that can be there can just add one more dynamic to it. Um, You know, the Bears are in a fortunate position where the roster is very good. Mm -hmm. You're very close to just a BPA type of situation. See, the one thing, the reason why I asked that question is you mentioned pass rusher and wide receiver. The one position I'm thinking about is running back too is because I'm looking here at um, bearswire.usa.com, um, and they, from last week, have a quote here from Nagy talking about what he wants in a running back. And the quote from Nagy was, when you're dealing with running backs, for us in this offense, you want to be able to have a guy that has really good vision, that can make guys miss. At the same time, there's that balance of being a hybrid, being able to make things happen in the past game too, and yet, to where you're not one-dimensional, and that's not easy. And, of course, the article goes on, well, duh, Nagy, you're describing Kareem Hunt. So you're basically saying, hey, we just need the next Kareem Hunt, sure, and we'll be fine. But for me, I'm looking just in that alone, because, of course, like you said earlier in the segment, Mark, of like, oh, just can we learn how to use – Jordan Howard. And really, I do think the offensive line was to blame mm-hmm. for a lot of Jordan Howard's struggles this year. But two guys I'm looking at, and I don't know if they're going to be A, I don't think I don't know if they'll be available for the Bears' first pick in the third round. And B, I don't know if the Bears make a trade to get into the second round to possibly get one of these two guys. But two of the guys, if the Bears are going to look running back to help out on some of those woes, two guys that fit that bill, Joshua Jacobs, who is a Alabama running back, elite vision, great pass catcher out of the backfield, and doesn't fumble the ball. Only had three fumbles, I want to say. Um, yeah, three f- career fumbles and hu- 317 touches. And the other one, it's going to be interesting to see how high he rises because he's got good vision and he's a pass catcher is Justice Hill out of Oklahoma State, but he's a guy who just ran a 4-4-40 at the NFL Combine, and people were really hyping up his 40 speed that that might boost his draft stock. Pat, I'm going to kick it to you before we go to Mark. Any final thoughts on the Bears and a possible regression for 2019? I feel like I sound like the biggest bear hater in the world despite the fact that I am a Bears fan because I just come on thinking that we're not going to meet the hype. (laughs) But I think it's usually, I think it's important to like recognize that like, hey, we had a really awesome season, but it's it's also understandable to realize that we might not be able to like recreate kind of like the magic of that first season with a lot of things going right. And I think it's important to like kind of assess like as a Bears fan, like, like here's our schedule. 
here's what we need to keep going right, and here's what we, what we need to see with this roster or the coaching of staff. And looking at it, I don't want to say that the Bears will be will regress next season, but a, a feeling inside of this goes like, hey, there's a genuine possibility that they could. I'm not saying they would miss the playoffs because I don't think they'll stoop to that, but they might not have the great season that they had last year in terms mm-hmm. of wins and losses. And that's okay if they still make the playoffs, but Bears fans shouldn't be out and about like screaming like we had such a terrible year after we were so great last year and to say, hey, this was coming in a way. Like we had a tougher schedule. Some things went, some things might happen in the next season, but we don't know that yet. But it's good to keep that in the back of your mind as a Bears fan so you're not surprised when like they might not win the division or just barely sneak into the playoffs. I think a funny thing too is, is we we talk about a little bit of the luck that the Bears had and how turnovers are difficult to replicate year to year. Um, but the Chicago Bears in their four losses, one play goes differently, and that's mm-hmm. a sixteen and O team. I mean, you look at a, it had took a miraculous comeback uh, from Aaron Rodgers. Mm-hmm. There was a huge special teams mess up. Uh, from from the Miami game, special teams again uh, for the Patriots. Uh, that Giants game, I mean, the outside we want kick. to talk about more, you know, special teams mm-hmm. situations. I mean, the Bears honestly were not far away from being, uh, you know, I, obviously one win changes everything there. Well, it's the beauty also of what we say, like one bad bounce with the football can change an outcome. Exactly. Um, you know, I think it's like the Bears only. Their total losses, they only lost by like 15 points total. Mm -hmm. Um, So they were a really good team. Um, And I think they'll continue to be a really good team next year, even if they regress a little bit. I'm not that worried about it. I think they'll be just fine. The thing I kind of want to throw out here at the end, and I before I say this, it might be a little far-fetched, but I'm still going to go out on my olive branch here and (laughs) make this comparison the Bears in 2019 have the potential to have a Cubs like 2015 2016 two seasons where 12 and 4. I know the playoff run was not as far, but also, like you said, if Cody Parkey's not on that team, you guys might be going on to the next round, and the Eagles would not be going on to playing. The Saints were. Like the Cubs, that 2015 year, that John Madden first year, we weren't expect. Now, of course, we didn't win the division like the Bears did, but we weren't expected to be in the championship series, but we were. And then that next year, we used that experience to then make a playoff run. I wonder if the Bears can be a team where it's like, hey, we're good enough to make the playoffs. And then once we get into the playoffs, hey, we're going to use that experience from last year, that bad taste in our mouth to go and make a playoff run. And, of course, it depends on what additions they make, what they do in the draft, um, how the Chuck Pagano um, addition adds to this team with them losing Vic Fangio to the Broncos. Because one thing I will say about the schedule, you got a lot of revenge games on it. Khalil Mack's going to want to beat the hell out of the Raiders. Matt Nagy, I'm assuming, will want to beat the hell out of the Chiefs. You've got... Vic Fangio going up against the Bears. I would think Vic would want to beat the old team to prove that um, he's doing well in Denver. And it's going to be interesting to see how things kind of play out for the Bears in 2019 after they set the bar a little bit high after Matt Nagy's first season. But this is where you guys come in. Let us know what you guys think down below in the comment section. Are we crazy for even asking this question? Is it like the Bears are fine? They're not going to regress. They're going to be okay in 2019. Also, let us know if you do think, (coughs) and to clear my throat there, if you do think they will regress, why do you think they'll regress? What's going to be the main reason for that? Make sure to hit us up on Patreon if you want to support us. Like Pat. Pat, obviously, thank you for your undying support and for everyone who supports us on Patreon.com backslash Most Vowel Podcast. Also, go and rate and review The Onside Kick on Apple Podcasts and iTunes. want to thank you guys for watching on YouTube, although you're looking at the logo right now. And thank you guys for listening on podcast services around the world. But as always, have a good day, everybody.